So once again, Pat, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate you having on the show and, uh, you know, coming and uh, giving us your words of wisdom. Thanks for being here. I'm thrilled to be doing anything for the show. Words of wisdom is a little strong from my <laughs> end, but let's, let's see where it goes. All right, cool. Now, before we get going, just in case people think, you know, I just have Max on the line pretending to be you or something, I was just hoping maybe you could give us like a, a Harold laugh just to kind of confirm your identity as, as Pat McKenna. Well, the laugh, let's see. Okay, I, I got to go back a little bit. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, that'll, that, that's confirmed. That'll work. Good. It goes through the, goes through the register there, and you'll, you'll see that that's me. <laughs> um, all right, so on the stream, uh, I'm just going to get right into the questions here. On the stream, we, uh, we kind of started back in Season 1, and we're kind of going through them sequentially. And watching Season 1, uh, you know, a lot of people asking about the beginning of the show, how it started, how, the, how people met, how the characters got sorted out, and things like that. Uh, one of our subscribers, Saints Angel, asked, how did you come up with Harold's personality? And I'm just sort of curious, you know, I was only maybe 10 at the time, so I wasn't aware of that kind of behind-the-scenes stuff before the show started. Just curious from you, I remember my dad saying that he um, came and saw you somewhere. It might have been Second City or somewhere else, and you performed sort of a high school nerd character, and that was the first time he had seen you do sort of what Harold became. Uh, just curious from your perspective and your memories, where did that character come from, and how did, that, how did you kind of get plugged into the show? The character started a long time before I met your dad, actually, it was a much different version, but that nerdy, hip swiveling character all started actually in London, Ontario at Second City, because Peter Callahan and I, Ranger Gord, were in the company together, and he, we used to do a scene where I had to come out as his son and ask to borrow the car, and Peter would give me this great, long, rhetorical answer, and I would say, so that's a no, but he could never really look at me, and then in the end, he would have to turn and look at me, so every night, I would try and come out and make Peter laugh. Because he's a you know great you know, Shakespeare and actor type man at this point particularly, so it was always fun to come up there. So the Harold character basically came out of just trying to make Peter laugh, and because he could never look at me, would get for why the audience was laughing while he was talking. Because Harold Ish <laughs> was doing all this off to the side, so that's really where it came from. So by the time I went to the main stage in Second City, I was doing the character in a sketch, and your dad happened to come in one night and and see the that character up on stage, and then got in contact with me afterwards saying, "Oh, that's a." interesting character to have stand beside this red green character that he's thinking of that doesn't move at all so for tv it'd be really a fun visual and so i i knew of your dad through uh, comedy mill and sns for sure growing up in hamilton so you know i followed through with the idea and happily married ever since <laughs> nice yeah and of course peter was on comedy mill as well so there's a, i guess another connection uh through you guys absolutely and linda cash was on there and linda at one point, I you know, suggested to your dad that maybe I could do some writing for Comedy Mill. So I think that's the first time I met him when you guys were living in Burlington, um, just before you moved to Hamilton, I guess. And I remember going up to the house and you know presenting some sketches and stuff, and your dad kind of going, yeah, maybe this one, maybe that one. And I thought, geez, he's, a, he's really strict in the writing. I thought this was going to be walk in, buy my stuff, and I'm a golden boy and walk out. No, no, no. He went right through with the red pencil and gave me my strengths and weaknesses and which ones were acceptable. And I was like, wow, this guy is uh, thorough. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first time I met him going, all right, so that's Steve Smith. I, I heard about this fellow. <laughs> that's why they got the real. I was just thrilled going to your house because I grew up watching you, <laughs> watching you guys on TV. Hmm. That's very cool. Yeah, I remember the first time I submitted a script to my dad, not a lot of it came back. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not getting a son free pass here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never do what it's worth. That's one thing. <laughs> now, uh, one thing else we're also talking about for season one is sort of the the small budget. Uh, you know, my dad's talked about how you know because of the the small budget for the for the first season, especially in the early seasons, I guess, how you had to sort of cram lots of things into small shoot days. So, like all the campfire songs done in one night. You know, studio days being packed with pages and pages of script. I'm just curious from your perspective, you know, what are your memories about that? Did you remember finding that difficult or was that just how we had to do it and it was fine? Um, how do you recall that, that first season? The first season was really interesting for me because I hadn't done much TV at all. So I really didn't know what 
to expect or what standards were or what normal even was. So when we were doing the first season, I was all, I was still working on the main stage at Second City at night. So we would. that's why I think part of it, from my perspective anyway, why it was so crammed during the day because I had to leave at 4 o'clock every day to try and get back to Toronto each night. So we were shooting all day, and I remember we didn't have lav mics or anything, just hard wire mics. So it like long cords. If you see the first scene, you see a lot of long cords coming out of the bottom of our pants and why we're sitting down in chairs so much because we really couldn't move around a lot. Hmm. And I thought, well, that was awkward because I was hired to, to move around a lot. You know? <laughs> so trying to find those scenes that were where I could stand and you know twist and do all those things. But the number of pages was really hard because, again, uh, being in the show at night was like so much to learn to get in the next day and then make sure the first day is always easy because you have a couple days to learn it mm. but the next day gets harder because the time is short now and i'm working at night so uh, most of those times i was up for like boy probably about 17 18 hours a day just trying to uh do both things for the longest time because there's so much work in there but i was laughing so hard every day <laughs> and the crew at, at ch when we were first shooting they had no idea what we we're doing and, you know, we'd have to do takes over again because they were shaking with the cameras, laughing and stuff. And, but if you look around the set a lot in the first season, you'll see I have scripts kind of hidden in the page around the floor. Really? So you're looking at the floor a lot because I, I just couldn't memorize that much stuff. Your dad was amazing. He was terrifying. He just knew everything. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God. I try to keep you know, going. I guess this is what you have to do. But mm. if you look around, like when I'm reading the campfire letters and stuff, you see that there's a little bit of a script hiding in front of the main letter. And, or I'd leave the, the script in the bag, and I'd reach in the bag and kind of pull the script out and read the letter from there. <laughs> I was trying every trick I could find to try and keep up with your dad. Well, it, it didn't come across. And I, that's, no, that's... He, he was very good at that. A couple times you go, no, no, you know your dad. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and put that down and be like, okay, yeah, i got to learn this one. <laughs> Well, he he wrote most of it too, so he has the advantage on the memorization, right? It's not like coming fresh to him. I I always thought that, but I you know still he was ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he was you know fifteen years. I got to know that. No, 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 no. <laughs> there was no shortcuts on certain things. <laughs> well, that kind of leads me, to, I guess, to my next question, which was, what was the best part of working with my dad, and what was the toughest part? And I've worked with him for a long time, so I'll know if you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> no. I the best part was it was always about the best what was best for the show and that was that was a really great thing to learn because like I said I didn't I hadn't done much TV so anything that I know now I probably learned from your dad so it was and he was so thorough on the, on like he had to do with everything the producing the directing the, everything right so I I was just there to facilitate make sure I didn't screw things up <laughs> but it was that type of uh, energy that your dad had was like that's that's how sharp you got to be to be in this game and he he set the ball the standard really high every time of knowing his lines being prepared and the, the worst part i think of working with your dad is exactly the same thing right. he's so prepared that you have no reason to complain about anything nobody works harder on the set i find than your dad hmm. so that's one of those whether it's the writing the performing whatever he has to do he's doing it 100 percent. so he's you know it's like trickle down economics it's trickle down <laughs> workaholic with your dad like there's no <laughs> There's no fooling around with uh, when it comes to work. And that part, I really, really respect it. So it was the toughest and the best because I, I love that kind of work. I think we just, I think that's one of the reasons we got along so well is we, we both put our head down and kind of kept moving forward all the time. He, it was truly the training from your dad that, that taught me all that stuff of don't be afraid. You know, like there was times I'd be so nervous and he'd go, they, the audience doesn't have time for you to be nervous. They, they need someone to, you know, to sail the ship. So we got to sail the ship. And it's like, okay, great, jump into that emergency situation, and suddenly uh, I was okay and to, to trust that I knew the lines, to do it in front of a live audience when we got there. And uh, He was a, a great captain to, uh, to follow along with. Hmm. Cool. Well, it, it seemed to me that, especially when live audiences were there, uh, and I guess in the early seasons just having the crew laugh, that's a, that's a, a place where you really flourished. You know, you you know would throw in ad libs or just your performance would really come alive with that feedback from the audience. Maybe that was you know came from Second City or or whatever you think. But yeah, why do you think the audience uh, you you were able to engage them so well? I, I do believe it was the Second City training of that because I knew I was more comfortable with that environment. That's what I kind of grew up in, so I knew how to do that because the hardest part of working without an audience is you're working in that vacuum if you don't know how long the laughter is so you don't know when to come in on the bubble of the, the height of the laugh and you know coast and stretch and pull so a lot of that 
for me was some of the charm of the first season is that was just your dad and I finding out together how we would work together mm. and the timing of what we thought would be the peak of a laugh and how long to stretch things without an audience. That was just, that's why I love the first season because it's an experiment of watching your dad and I just kind of find each other and what our comedy was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then by the, when the audience started to come in, it would confirm that or, or challenge it. And you'd have to find that nuance of this is how long we hold it. And, and you always trust that the editors can make it shorter but they can't make it longer. That was another phrase of your dad's. So it'd be, you know, st keep keep the laugh going as long as you can, but don't kill it. Mm. It was a real uh, dance between mm. the two of us, I think particularly for the first three or four seasons of finding that energy between us, because the second season was such a different one. And then third and four, when we went to, I think it was London by then, and the live audience. And I remember your dad coming backstage afterwards going, we can never go back. We have to have a live audience every time. They're never wrong. So, and that was another thing. The audience is never wrong. You know, as comedians, oftentimes you go, oh, this, this audience is off tonight. No, no, no. It's, it was our job to communicate better to that room. So, you know, you were there many times in between those shows of just, you know, fine tuning a joke. You know, what made it not work that time? Who stepped on water? What was off? Or how do we get that to work? And watching him you know, scientifically figure out what that was and go back and do it the second time. And it was so much better. Hmm. Yeah, the best feedback, right? That yeah, always They're, the audience is there to, to, to react to your, uh, your element and your, your choices and watching them understand what you're trying to get across was so great. That idea of we started doing things like that, where I could kind of look out to the camera a little bit and watching that laugh change of when we could share that with the audience and when to stay in the scene and when to pulse it out and that, that ebb and flow with the audience, you know, they were constantly aware that they were part of the show because either your dad as Red would look out or Harold could look out to them and you'd call to them like, is it me? Is it me? <laughs> or do you see that he's crazy too? And you know, they, they would all be on your side for a while and they would all switch over to Red's side. It was mm. such a wonderful give and take with that with the audience every time. Mm. Cool. Now you mentioned uh, season two and how different it was. Now I do notice you are doing a comedy show coming up with Neil Crone and Kevin Frank who were both on season two as Doc... Uh, and Noel and uh, so you want to talk a bit about that We'd, I'm sure some of our fans would love to hear that that's happening uh, but also just what are your memories of season two so different you know um, uh, you know obviously much much different from season one and really any of the other seasons as well what do you remember about uh, season two season two was like standing in the in the middle of a carnival on a Saturday night it was is so busy compared to what season one was. And I don't know too much of the background of why it had to be like that. I know CH wasn't sure of the show and, you know, it needed younger people and all those different things that people in the third floor always throw down at the stage, you know, of why you should be different. And I guess your dad was reacting to that and hired a lot of great people. There was nothing wrong with the people. But what I found the biggest problem was, was there's just too many chefs because everyone was pretty much from Second City, a couple stand-ups from Yuck Yucks. So it was everyone was like throwing in a line, making things a little bit longer, as opposed to a really tight script, which I think is where your dad really loves. Because mm -hmm. I remember in the very beginning, your dad said the only reason the show got started was because he was a writer and didn't think anybody would hire him to perform it. So the red, you know, he did a lot on his own that way. And I knew he. One thing your dad loves is is the words and the structure and the rhythm, and that really wasn't being respected on that set. There mm -hmm. wasn't. Uh, we were all too young to be. Uh, strong actors enough to know that hmm. uh, everyone was a comedian trying to justify why they were there you know so the, it was a very uh, loud busy room and i think it was really hard to harness all those kittens and toilet paper at the same time you know <laughs> everyone was just kind of running all over the place and i think that came across to the audience too it wasn't the red green show anymore it was just a kind of a little loud and busy it was a great character, it was a great introduction to all this this world because it unfolded as the seasons went on, and you know certain ones stayed, certain ones didn't help the story as much, and different characters came in to play that idea. And I, the the advantage of season two, I thought, is it, it gave your dad an opportunity to explore a lot of different characters mm -hmm. in a very fast time, and then to you know mine those ones that we would keep as the years went on. Yeah, and you sort of saw that the the show progressed that way, right? So characters would come in, they would come out. Maybe a similar one would would come on a little bit later. Uh, a lot of sort of on the fly tinkering, almost uh, it seemed like. Yeah, because like something like uh, Neil Crone's character of Doc was very much the probably the inspiration for Hap Shaughnessy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the, the fisherman who tells the big stories. But then it had to be somebody that, you know, it, Neil was a little too young to have that much knowledge and, mm. and wisdom. You know, so someone like, you know, who had a character actor guy they brought in. Oh, yeah, Gordon Pinsley. <laughs> Who? <laughs> and then you, know, you lay that and you give someone like Gordon that, then he's got all that, those years of history to make up those lies that he may have worked with the Rolling Stones. He could have been <laughs> in Vietnam. So, you know, he just had this world of you know, what part do you challenge? He could have done that. And I think that was the, the brilliance of your dad too, was to see the, the potential of the Neil character with that. He wasn't able to explore it as well as the next guy might. Right. Cool. But Neil, Kevin, and I uh, who are doing these improv shows now. But again, I knew them uh, going on 35 years now. And you know, it's just older guys. We thought we should just get out and have some fun. And we did it as a benefit. And it worked so well that people were hiring us at the benefit to do other things for them. I was like, I, you know what, guys? I think maybe we got a little gig going here. <laughs> Very cool. And that's the Yes Men? That's the Yes Men, yeah. Cool. And yet- in improv, everything is you say yes, you say yes. So that's what we're mm. kind of doing is just reminding ourselves when we get out there of how to improvise, say yes. So anything the crowd says, you have to say yes to it. Pretty much. You <laughs> try and say yes to it and build on that idea. Heighten and explore. Heighten and explore. Nice. Cool. Well, you mentioned uh, Gordon Pinsent as one. Uh, you know, as we're re-watching these, you know, just noticing they, there were some pretty big name actors who kind of showed up on our set. And, uh, you know, played around with us, you know, talking about Graham Greene, Gordon Pins and others who, you know, were successful. You know, Peter Callahan was on American sitcoms and, you know, just it's it was kind of uh, crazy. Uh, it was f- cool, but also a little bit like, why are these guys coming on our show? Uh, do you recall ever sort of being star- starstruck on set or just being surprised that someone was coming and doing our show? Oh, yeah, I was constantly starstruck when they, especially when Graham came in, because that was right at the time of Dancing with Wolves. Mm-hmm. And so he was just, you know, wow, that guy's going to do the show. <laughs> and then, and Gordon Pinson, too. I mean, anyone in Canada growing up with Gordon was like, oh my goodness, he's coming on the show. It was always fun on set to watch the entire set change. Like the, the crew, everything we got tighter and better and sharper and more professional. And stuff, which, you know, I took as an insult going, hey, I was here last week. Nobody cared. <laughs> you know, your dad and I go, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Everybody's so much better for these guys. So everybody was in reaction knowing that the show was was definitely catching on. Because I remember when I was growing up, I remember Batman was like that. You, you turn on Batman and then all of a sudden there's all these celebrities popping out of the windows saying hi as they climbed up a building and stuff. It was just cool to be on Batman at that era for its stars, you know? It introduced them to a whole new audience. Hmm. So I started, I started thinking of our show as Batman, because you'd turn around <laughs> going, who's going to who's gonna want to be on this week? And then, oh, there's Paul Gross at the height <laughs> of Due South being on the show. You know, it's like, this is hilarious. They're all just running to be on the show, which was such a compliment, because, you know, yourself, you're making the show. You're, you're just making it. You don't know how fans are reacting to it. You know, it's, that's later for TV to determine all that stuff. So when people start rushing towards you, you're going... I think we're connecting, hmm. which was really hard to get any recognition in the Toronto area that we were getting recognition from the studios and respect. We knew throughout Canada and the mid America that it was knocking them out, but it was really hard to get Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, New York, Chicago, some of the big cities to acknowledge that this, this was a huge market. Hmm. You know, and, I, and then you could see other people coming to it and PBS cities going, coming to it. Everyone was coming to the show. We didn't have to go to them. And that was really interesting because the audience was definitely seeking us out. So it was great for the stars to come on the show. And Wayne Robson, when Wayne walked into, he was another guy. You know, I grew up watching Canadian films going, that's the guy from The Great Fox. That's the guy from Popeye. That's, holy smoke. <laughs> it just kept getting larger and larger. You know, it was, it was wonderful. And particularly with the movie, when suddenly again, you know, Lawrence Dane and mm. Fiona Reed, and all these names, you know, the Air Force. And people were lining up to be in it. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was a very cool time for sure. Now, talk about, you just mentioned uh, the movie Duct Tape Forever. Um, what do you remember about doing that? I mean, you, by that point, you'd done the show for many years. Um, what, what was being on set for the Duct Tape Forever movie like? How was it sort of different, I guess, than, uh, than doing the show? Doing the movie was an interesting time because I've been out of the show, I think, for about a year at that point. And uh, it, it was very interesting. And I, it was one of those things that I had to leave the show because I was just exhausted and broken down. I was doing the, another television series at the same time. And it was like seven days a week for over five years. And I was just 
breaking down and i noticed that i was the guy it's the weird thing when you look around on the set and you go oh, oh i'm the weird apple in this barrel i guess i gotta go because i wasn't prepared i wasn't energetic i wasn't having as much fun and it, i knew it was me the show hadn't changed it was all just my exhaustion so i talked it over with your dad and you know and he said well you know if harold goes i gotta fill that void with the other characters and i said i respect that i, I just i don't want to be not ever not liking this show i don't want to be in that position so I, I think i should step aside and get better and your dad was great about that and then then they phoned later on but said you know we got this movie thing going would you be interested in coming back for that and i thought well the movie's great we're probably about 30 days i think i can handle that so when i i truly remember the day of uh, we, we were in one of those camps was it I can't remember the name of the camp or Camp Marydale or something like that or Camp Nebo. But all the trucks and vans and all the whole wagon world, the circus that makes movies happen. And your dad and I were standing up top of a hill looking down at this valley. And we were just in awe that, you know, only a few years later we're standing in CH with your mom's bagged lunches <laughs> that we had for lunch and the hard wires coming out our feet and going, what a difference. And hmm. your dad said, you know, do you ever think of coming back? And I said, oh, man, if I could have fun like this again, I'd be back in a heartbeat. So, yeah. And I think that opened the door for me to come back, which was, you know, that's why the movie became incredibly important for me because it brought me back into the fold of the show. But on the set it was so different because it was run, you know, the nice thing about the way the Red Green Show was, it was on a very limited budget. So you had to do the work in the moment. And the film was like that too. It was very low budget for films, but at the same time, it, everyone was comfortable because when working the show so much it's like this is how you do a scene you do it tight and you do it fast and i don't think we had too many problems other than your dad stabbing himself in the hand <laughs> it, was the, That's awesome. it was the only day we had this kind of change the schedule for a bit and you know your dad being his, your typical dad he went to the hospital and came back and continued filming you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was amazing like even when we were shooting the scene we shot the scene with someone cut said okay hospital and you know and then your dad there was no stopping the scene the fact that your dad just put a knife through his hand and <laughs> have severed every nerve there was no stopping it was like again how do you challenge that when we, i stubbed my toe wow you can't <laughs> well and we had <laughs> well we had to stop uh so that people could uh replay it on slow-mo to see the knife going through the hand over and over again as well <laughs> real supportive crew <laughs> It was incredible. Yeah, it was it was so great because again, like I say, with the film, the stars that were coming to the film, and the, you know when we were shooting, people were putting their lawn chairs all around watching the film and stuff. It was so much like the show where you had to, people just bought into the premise. You know, mm. use my cafe, use our street. Yes, do what you need. Can my dog be in it? <laughs> it was wonderful. You know, and again, the duct tape toys were the things that were everybody made. You know, all the the sculptures and everything were all volunteer school, high schools and stuff. It, it was such an exciting uh, community event hmm. that it it was it really felt plugged in, and that was great. The whole PBS experience was like that. You know, a couple of times your dad and I would go down, and I remember the country and western stars would always say, "If you shake somebody's hand, they're, they're your fan forever." Hmm. And the PBS tours really introduced me to that of how dedicated fans can be if you just go down and involve them and include them. You know the way they were in the audience at the end of the night, and they'd come down and be in the men's group and stuff. And it, it was it was such an inclusive party. Everybody had a great time. Cool. Yeah, we've got a lot of people uh, joining us on Twitch or from PBS stations. We have a list going. Anyone who mentions a station in uh, in chat, we have a list of you know where kind of where we're from. So uh, it, you know there are still I still get Iowa fans and Salt Lake City and all over the states saying, "Hey, yeah, we love we are... love the show." <laughs> If, if, I remember too when they started doing the PBS pledge drives hmm. and you know if for the first couple of years you know your dad mostly would go down and do them and then a couple him and I did and a couple Rick and him would do and then I think I don't know how, where the, the brilliant notion came from but your dad said why don't they come to us and we shot them all in the CH studios and just had the challenge from there and watching Iowa go up against you know the Salt Lake City or Jacksonville Florida it was wonderful bringing them into the fold and watching them compete amongst themselves so we just had to kind of you know be rodeo clowns and keep the money going up yep. and I think Red Green was one of the biggest fundraisers for PBS in its history we were beating out the three tenors and everything for raising money for them <laughs> kind of crazy right yeah, it was from our perspective. It was because again, you're just working out of the CH studio, so you don't know how people are reacting to mm -hmm. it. I'm sure your dad had way more info on that, but I was stunned every time of watching this huge snowball come rolling at us of red green fans. Of this is great. <laughs> nice. Now, um, oh, we. I was going to ask you about at the end of season two. I kind of just blew right by it, but the end of season two, the show actually did get canceled by CH, despite 
making the changes that CH wanted my dad to make creatively, they still canceled it after season two. Did you, were you aware that it got canceled? Um, and if so, did you think that that's it, that this is, that was a good two year run and now it's over? Or did you not even know that? No, I, you know, the weird thing about Canadian TV is you think it's over every year. <laughs> you know, once you, once you shoot it, they never give you an idea that, you know, you're automatically picked up. So every year for me for 15 years was a surprise. <laughs> you know, it was like, Hey, great. We're coming back. But that particular two, three seasons where I, I found very bumpy because the critics were pretty mean to the show and, and in particular, very mean to me. Hmm. So I thought, well, even if we do come back, you know, Steve's not going to include this character because they just, you know, they beat him up pretty well in, the, in a lot of the reviews. And then, so when the second season came and it's like, okay, we know we're reacting, we're going, I'm, I'm thrilled to be involved. And then I did hear that we were canceled. And I thought, and I remember your dad and I, you know, miserating about this because it was, they made, made all the changes they asked for and then got canceled, which only proved to your dad, I'm sure but they didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't get the show, you know, so for him to be strong enough to carry it on to, I believe it was almost CTV next, I think, or YTV, one of the two. Yeah. I think season three, it went to London. And then after that, yeah. there was a YTV after that, I think. After that. So that process of being able to pick it up and, and still sell it going, he knew that show had something to it and he had to see it through. And I think that's why season two got eliminated because that was somebody else's show. Hmm. That wasn't your dad's vision. And he knew that show. And I, and there's times when I came in and I, you know, I tried to just uh, maybe help with jokes or, or things like that, but I would never s- try and steer the show because that was your dad's show. That vision was his. It had to be seen through and solidified. Any compliment that I get from the show, I totally pass on to your dad because I was just a, an instrument in the band. Hmm. It was his orchestra, that's for sure. Well, you brought... Uh a ton to the show over the years. So don't, don't sell yourself short on that. Absolutely. And you talked about, you know, early on, maybe critics, critics being harsh on you. You know, the fact that, uh, even though my dad can be tough, as you said earlier, the fact that he, you know, he saw that in you and, and wanted you to be a core member of the show. And there you were for, you know, so many seasons, the fact that Harold character lasted shows a lot about what he thought about you as a person and also Harold as a, as a character, which is, which is pretty cool. It's very cool, and I really respected that. And I, that's one of the reasons I tried to uh, behave as best <laughs> as professionally as, as I could, because I didn't know a lot about things. So I just had to totally trust your dad. If this is what we're doing, then then it must be the right thing to do. Mm. Because I learned so much about writing and timing and structure and everything that like that sort of goes into the creation of the show without actually having to do it, but having to respect those boundaries. And it was always interesting as the show went on, there was times where I was sort of the, the second in command. People would come to me going, how do we do this? Because like, they'd be afraid to ask you. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, how do we, do we just go in and you start talking or what's it like this? Or it's like, just, just be casual and just follow the lead. And as long as you're having fun in the audiences, Steve's going to love it. And if he doesn't, he'll let you know right away. Just, just be, be the guy you need to be. But everybody knew your dad, dad had a vision, and then they weren't sure how they fit into it. Because you're, this, this is like, like there's things that are happening now in, in the system that are so common that were not common back back then. Your dad started so many things. The the interviewing of of actors and just talking to them, and then later on writing a character that might fit naturally to that person. Hmm. So they didn't have to act too hard. They just had to be. There was just a part of their personality that he could you know mix comedic heights out of some of those things mark wilson the guy who just sat around the the, the yeah the, the just sat around the marina yeah glenn braxton yeah the grass yeah so that was basically mark so it was like well this would be really easy because a lot of us were so young we weren't very strong actors so your dad made it easier for us as performers to just use who we were hmm. you know and that was like neil with his uh, his storytelling abilities and hmm. kevin frank with his walling he became the security guard and then you know it was just so many things that fit nicely into these elements that you could grow. And so when you were that comfortable with yourself, you were, you're finding your own comedic voice in front of the audience, you know, confirming that. And I think that's how Harold got to grow as the seasons went on, because the audience started to tell you mm, that joke str- works really well now because he's getting a little older, you know, cause I, I was 30 when I started the show and I was playing a teenager, you know, and I was young hmm. and thin enough back then to kind of do that, to infer maybe he's 18 or so and maybe forever. And there'd be years I'd put weight on. You kind of go, oh, he's getting older. 
Mm. And you have, well, you have to react to that, you know, especially the longer the show went on, you had to assume that Harold would get older. Red could always be red. <laughs> you know? Red was this age where people didn't know. He was just red. Yeah. Harold was definitely changing. So the, the scripts were reacting to that and the, 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 the struggle you go through of early 20s of trying to be a man, mm. you know, and finding a way he, he included that. And I think a lot of times, to be honest, he was probably seeing what you guys were going yeah. through as young men <laughs> and putting that into the Harold voice, you know, and, mm-hmm. and watching that be that because my son, who is also hanging around, was so much younger than you guys, you, you couldn't really <laughs> tell from him. So I thought, if he knows what's going on young men, it's got to be through you and Max. So I subtextually knew what was going on in your life through what I was playing on stage. <laughs> well, and, and I, w- I would know oh, what my... car this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I would also, on the flip side of that, I could watch the show and know how my, how my dad really wanted to talk to me by what he was saying to you. fun thing about the Harold character was for me people say, you know the, 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 they talk about the comedy teams thing and I always thought well I'm I'm your mom yeah I'm, I'm Morag in this situation because your dad was so used to being with another person on stage mm-hmm. you know so I thought this is how he this is how he interacts great so I'm that role I'll, you're supporting it you're the voice of reason it was always interesting that people thought Harold was the crazy one but to me Harold was always the straight man because he was the one who was always going, Uncle Red, you can't do that. That was from basically day one. You know? mm. And it was always the way he approached it was differently. And as the seasons went on, he you know, he went from a childlike ideas to adolescent ideas of let's blow that up. You know, we could, that's the only way to solve anything. We've got to blow that up. We've got to move it. We've got to be aggressive. It was more adolescent choices where now you're as the voice of reason. It's getting a little more hurried and rushing. Uncle Red, no, really, you can't do that. Mm. And that would be you know, the first scene or the second one that they were escalating these problems of and watching Harold become stronger and stronger in that relationship as, as a marriage would, as, you know, father and son living together, that type of thing of the roles become somewhat reversed. You know, as time goes on, you start to become almost one voice. Right. And I thought that was a really cool progression of these two that they almost became one person, you know, the good voice and the bad voice hmm. in your head. You know? The two, on, the on devil and angel on your shoulder. Yeah. You know, you, if the good voice in your head is Harold's, can you trust it? <laughs> so I thought there's so many inherent conflicts that were so great for comedy to explore, you know? Right. It was, they were just riddled. And I remember one time we got a, a note backstage. And, you know, again, as a young comedian, I was thrilled where your dad and I got uh, entered into the, uh, the the Sons of the Desert comedy uh, mm. legends, I think it was. And the Sons of the Desert was, like, I think it's Laurel and Hardy, Abba Costello, uh, Martin Lewis and Smith and McKenna. Because there's only wow. us, you know. And for, for me, I was like thrilled because that meant we're working. We mm. found out what this rhythm is. I was so excited going, this perfect. We got a vocabulary. We got this stuff that audiences are reacting to. They know who we are. Only one of us can say that line, not the other guy, because it has to be true. And so I, I knew then that from, you know, the outside confirmation of here we go. We, we got this figured out. We I could trust the rhythm so much. Hmm. Yeah, you're talking about the the progression of the characters. That's something that that I definitely see when I when I watch it. It seems to me that you know the pre Red Green show Red Green character, so on Smith and Smith, and a bit on Me and Max, and then on Comedy Mill, was very deadpan, low energy, kind of almost stoic. And I can see how the the your character of, of Harold being animated physically would be such a contrast. And and the first season of Red Green, the Red Green Show, seems like Red. My, my dad is still performing Red that way. But then as the seasons progress, it seems like he starts gaining energy. He becomes the child who's excited, as you said, about blowing something up or whatever is happening. And and you kind of switched from being the this energy beside this stoic guy to, as you said, the mom, kind of the voice of reason and a, a kind of uh, trying to harness and, and redirect Red's energy. Now he, he's become an energetic character. Uh, really interesting to see. I remember that transition, actually. Hmm. When we were at, I remember when the transition is when we moved to CBC and uh, Rick Green was started to direct. You know, your dad was handing off more responsibilities. Like there was, became a writing team more than just him and Rick and a fusual, an occasional submission by other players. Hmm. It became the team, which, you know, you were part of certainly. And, and that grew. And I remember when Rick was directing, I remember him standing in front of us one time going, you know, Steve, you got, you just got to move around a little bit more. But, and I wasn't sure if your dad would take that because Rick and I move around, hmm. but that's not read so much. But as you say, the first season, particularly with the little rubber duck on the hat and the whole bit, just <laughs> sitting on the bench and, 
not a, you know, I didn't know if his eyes moved or anything <laughs> else, you know. It was really stoic because it was going for that Red Fisher laugh and it was dead on. But I, I don't know if, then we got the visually and the camera was back further and the set was brighter. Like it was way brighter than the first season too. It was lit differently. Hmm. That it forced your dad, red green rather, to be more energetic just to fill hmm. that space. Because hmm. it wasn't close-ups anymore as much as it was in, in the old days. Things just changed subtly. That I remember watching your, and I was odd because I remember the very first day when we came out to do it that night and watching your dad take those notes and find areas to move. And other times he wasn't comfortable. You know, in the second show it would be different. It's like you, watching your dad find moving within Red Green was even different. Hmm. You know, you now you now you look at Red Green and you see the hands in the pocket and it's shaking and it's bumping inside his pocket mm -hmm. when he gets an idea and stuff. You know, none of that was there. That was all your dad just slightly discovering these things. And from an outside perspective, I thought it was great because some of that stuff when he started to move a little bit was like, now you see where Harold gets it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a bit of a family trait, but I'm just the extreme of it. But it's there where that energy, once an idea starts coming, it starts vibrating in the person a little bit. You know, and it was, your dad found it in a, it was never a discussion. It was only an ob observation I noticed later going, oh, he's moving. So I would stand still during those times when your dad would be getting excited when he wasn't then you see harold move there's like a dance going on between us all the time of who's got the focus of who can move and that was a really cool balance to find that because you were just layering in those laughs together and and i knew we never your dad and i discussed this but we knew there was a complete trust and respect of of that type of comedy we played that we played it so well together it was just a joy to to ex allow each other to grow because if somebody got a laugh you you knew you just you could trust that that guy would stand there and stare you in the eyes until it was over mm. it was it was wonderful it was such a great uh, exchange of, of energies and stuff it was wonderful mm. yeah we we've uh as the seasons progress and it, it, it's not like it never happened in the early seasons by about but by about season four season three season four it seems like um Harold gets more last laughs on Red at the end of the scene than than he he did earlier on. It's almost like um, my dad was uh, giving you some even play, as you said, and the audience would react would be on your side sometimes too. Uh, it's just really yeah. interesting to see that Harold character kind of growing, coming into his own, and being able to kind of you know kind of get Red last sometimes. Sometimes it would, yeah, exactly. Depending on what that argument was, mm. and that was the the respect to of who's going to win this scene, because that's always you know there's always a change in the scene from beginning to the end of who's going to win it. And when you look and you go, okay, Harold wins this one, so you got to lay the groundwork up here early and make this look ridiculous enough and all that balance to make that happen. Mm. And I thought it was so great because the longer the lodge life went on, the the deeper the relationships got where Harold could say things he couldn't say when he first was hanging out with uncle red, when he, you know, those things you're afraid to say to your superior and your, and your elders <laughs> at a young age, and you get a little more confident in your early twenties kind of thing, you mm. know? And I, and I thought that was a great social experiment of the brave moment. Harold would take just to, to spike his uncle and it being okay because that was the cool thing too. With it was really easy to to pick on Harold and punch down and get jokes that way. And we certainly had those too, because the audience loved those. But it was always interesting to that they respected the character enough that you couldn't abuse it. Mm. You know, you had to be gentle enough. And as long as I didn't take offense to what Uncle Red said to Harold, then it wasn't offensive. Mm. And that was and it was a very fine line. There was times I would wince or something like that, and you could almost hear the audience go, "Oh, oh yeah." Which would be great if you needed that, but there was times if they ever said, oh, I was like, oh, no, okay, now it's turned into a bully moment, yeah. and it's not funny anymore. <laughs> you got to walk that line of where sarcasm is the, is the exchange of vocabulary at the lodge, mm -hmm. and that's and that's a big part of particularly comedy in the 90s and, and so on was sarcasm in North American comedy is a huge thing. So you kind of watch that play back and forth of who gets to be sarcastic without offending. Mm. It, it became the way that's how we say things because within that sarcasm you could almost see the outcome without having to say it like okay uncle Ray, you drive that car without brakes today and i'll see you i'll, I'll meet you down at the hospital afterwards <laughs> you know that type of thing and you just say that where you let the audience fill in the blanks right where it would go in between there going oh no it's going to end in the hospital we don't know how but that's where it's going to go <laughs> cool um 
Now, you know, a lot of the people coming to the Twitch chat so far, uh, you know, they're Red Green fans. They know you as Harold, but not all of them. I mean, some of them actually have know the other some of the other things that you've done things like traders things like stargate but not everyone knows just kind of how well-rounded you are and i remember i'm not sure what year it was but i'm pretty sure you won a gemini which is the canadian television awards for our american fans uh in the same year for um uh, best comedic actor for harold on red green and for best dramatic actor for marty on traders is do i have that right yeah that was uh 98 yeah, that happened, and that was uh, that was a really yeah weird experience because you know Red Green was nominated, and we were beyond thrilled. We couldn't believe that we were actually you know being acknowledged by Toronto. That was amazing. And then for some, and how I got nominated for Traders, that was a an uphill climb too. That whole experience of from '95 to 2000 was you know kind of a a wicked fast wonderful blur for me. Mm. But it was so exciting that. Uh, for me, Red Green was the huge one when I got the awards of, of those two nights. To be acknowledged by our peers, because your dad and I won them together really on that night. So that that was huge for me because we've been working since 1990, you know, and we're eight years into it. And finally, we're up on stage wearing tuxedos, accepting awards for these two people, <laughs> Harold and Red. And the internal laugh was so great. Of look where we are. <laughs> this is hilarious. This is amazing. It's so great. That that night was so magic on so many levels. But to me, that was the big one because it was such a long climb, and never giving up on the premise of the show, making audiences come to us. And that really felt like the Gemini's came to us. You know, hmm. we uh, we earned them that that year, and it was it was a great great experience. And then from that, because of the those awards in Canada, it opened a lot of doors because you know eight years of Harold, there were definitely casting agent went oh that's that's the herald character mm -hmm. and we don't need him in our drama we, you know that's what that guy it was just too big it was you know hiring gilligan to be in you know perry mason it's like it's not going to work so it took a long time but that credibility suddenly gave that opened other doors mm. and that that really got things going where they suddenly went oh this guy is a guy who can play comedy and drama oh that's great we can use that as long as they started focusing on that as opposed to the characters, then it became a, a much more open door, which allowed me to do the Stargates and the, the other series and films and things that kind of came along afterwards. Right. It was definitely uh, an uphill climb those first few years. Right. Yeah, We ha some, of our, some of our subs uh, kind of submitted questions along those lines. Brink Little says, um, you know, do you think being Harold helped or hurt your career? And Marcus Spears says, uh, did you have trouble with being typecast as sort of a Harold type character? So I guess what you're saying is that, you know, well, you, you must have got you got the job on Traders before the Gemini uh, for being a dramatic actor. So you were able to still do that. Uh, but then maybe getting that that other Gemini for dramatic acting helped open some doors for you. Exactly. But I, even getting the audition for Traders was I was an active choice because at that point I wasn't getting a lot of other auditions because they kept seeing me as Harold. Right. So when this trader show came along, I remember saying to my agent, you know, there must be something in this drama for me. And they're like, no, no, there's nothing here and blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, can I look at the breakdown? And there was this Marty character and they described, it and I said, well, he, it's not, he's not funny, but he's passionate and he's, and I can see his insecurity so I can play this guy. And I said, well, I'll try and get you an audition. And it was truly the last day at five o'clock that they, they allowed me to come into audition. And it was like, so that's the spot that basically says, we don't care. We're already done. Fine. We'll come see you. Yeah, we're <laughs> done, but we'll see, you know, we'll see you cause your agent pleaded. And when I went into the audition room, there was guys who looked nothing like me and they're all wearing these wonderful suits and stuff. And I was wearing, you know, my, 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 my little tie and jacket. And I thought, oh my God, this, I'm so out of my league here. I, I don't look like these guys at all. So that, that's what stuck in my craw. I was like, I don't look at these guys at all, so I'm really different. Mm. So I went into the men's room, and I had to take out coffee, and I threw the coffee on my shirt, and I untucked everything. I went completely different than anybody else walking in there and, and went in there and, and did the scene. And then about a week later, I got a call back for it, and the writer of the show, who Hart Hansen, who went on to create Bones and so on, said to me, he goes, you know, you got the gig. You got it the, the first day because you were like nobody else. What she did was just so different. Mm. And that's what and that's what I learned from Second City and I learned from Red Green was that this is the moment I'm in now. I have to communicate to this room, not what I think is going to work. Mm. I got to do be in this moment. Mm. And that that's when I got that job. But they were not going to see me. And even when I got the award, the casting agent phoned me the next day and gave me hell for not thanking her 
for getting the award for the uh, for the drama. And I was stunned, going, "Are you kidding? You wouldn't. Even, you didn't even want to see me. You didn't think I could do it. And now you expect me to go on national TV and thank you? It's like, Holy smoke! I couldn't believe she did that. Of course, you know that was what going on uh, 20 years ago, and uh, she hasn't phoned me since. So I guess she still holds a grudge. That's amazing. Now, yeah, so you talked about Traders and Stargate. I know you've, you know, looking at your IMDb page, you've done a ton of, of work um, over the years. Uh, voice work as well. I see you've been getting into a lot as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Just, just sort of curious about, you know, as someone who's experienced, you know, other sets and how other productions do things, does anything stick out to you now looking back on uh, the Red Green set as being kind of unique or different? Or, or was it pretty par for the course in terms of Canadian um, you know, series? No, no, it wasn't at all. And I didn't really know that really until right. I got the Traders gig because it was it was one of those great big TV shows that had millions and millions of dollars invested. You know, so the catering was so different in trailers and the makeup. It wasn't my mom's lunch bags, yeah. you're saying? <laughs> well, I thought that was normal. She was completely happy with that. And so the, when I look back on the first particularly the first two years of Red Green, I guess, were um, like like a, um, not a student film, but like a, hmm. there was that element of, of budget and time that was, everything was important and, and so on. I don't mean to, to, to lower to, to that kind of uh, mm -hmm. standard. That sounds right. That's, that's what was going on. You know, so when I got on the other sets and I saw that, then by season three, when we got to London, you know, we started getting Swiss Chalet sent in. Mm. <laughs> we got a budget. This is going well. <laughs> you know, this is really neat. And then, then catering started to happen because it was different. You know, also, I think that when things uh, like other casts were coming in, be it Graham Greene and, and mm. Gordon's and so on, that they were used to different environments. Right. So it really started to change there. And by the time we got to CBC, it was like every other set I'd ever been on. Mm. Here, this is our break and this is the time and here's the call. It just wasn't as casual and as flowing. It all worked great, but it was just so different than the way we all started. Hmm. But now when I'm working, I'm working on a series up in Sudbury, and it's exactly like the set was back in 1990. Of the lunches are brought in by different people. This is how we do at the time. You know, again, what I was saying earlier about stuff that's normal now is stuff that your dad had started. Hmm. And that's how, because the Canadian economy and film and television is so beaten up right now. Hmm. That that's that's that has to be the entry level. Everybody's coming in at that level of we're doing the best we can. All the money's going on the screen. Mm. If everybody buys into that, we're okay. And so I'm on the show Hard Rock Medical now, and it's the fourth season. And you know, people are complaining and this and that. We don't. It's like to me, it's completely normal. <laughs> like, this is great. Uh, we got we got a room to share. We got food on, on the table in front of us, and we got lines. We don't even have to make up the words. Someone else said them, make them up for us. All we got to do is say these. <laughs> relax this is a blast it's a blast hmm. you know so now eric peterson's doing that show hmm. and he's the same way kind of going this is what canadian tv is hmm. get aboard people <laughs> and again you know you have to go back to 1990 when i'm going yeah I, this is exactly how i started and this is exactly where i am hmm. cool now uh again some of our fans who know you from red green might not know that you and rick uh as adults have been doing work in the field of add and so I just yeah. I kind of wanted to, to get, give you a chance to talk about that a little bit and also just kind of ask you, you know, obviously being being diagnosed as an adult with ADD, uh, just sort of looking back how how you see maybe your years as a performer on the Red Green Show or whatever, uh, how maybe that impacted th those times and uh, those experiences. It was really different. It was during the show that Rick w was diagnosed, I hmm. think, and uh he came to me and he was talking about he was going to do this DVD. And, and the more he talked about it, I, my son was diagnosed. And I said, yeah, he has it. And he said, well, then you probably have. And I said, oh, yeah, I definitely got it. I've never been diagnosed, but yeah, sure, I got it. And he goes, well, you want to host this thing? So it turned into that. And the more I hosted, the more information I got. And then I started looking back at my life and going, oh, how many ADD choices were made? How many times was ADD making the choice mm. and not me out of the excitement? And, when I, and the show was particularly one of those where – learning 56 pages a night is heightened drama to most people and overwhelm. But if with an ADD mind where you're always kind of craving something to do, hmm. it was great. Hmm. And that energy was, and the deadline of having to know it for Wednesday at six thirty 
was was great for me because if hmm. someone said you know you got to learn this within a month like great the night before i'll start doing it that's add you procrastinate <laughs> but I did, there was no room for procrastination hmm. so it was always go 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 and then again when i looked at it, it was like oh years later as i found out okay now i'm running at that rhythm on, on the little hamster wheel i need something else to do so that's when traders really came in hmm. and it's like I, I saw like needed to get something else happening so when that happened and then both shows were going like this is add friendly too where i'm in such constant demand and overwhelm that i flourish i get comfortable when i'm really exhausted like that but as i say it went on for five years seven days a week and it just caught up to me where the candle was burnt hmm. you know so that's when i look back at what add did is like yes it helped me learn lines like crazy for both shows hmm. i can memorize things like crazy now <laughs> from that element and it also taught me to be in the moment immediately, you know, to, to get the take in one, not seven. You know, where I'm on sets now, I get flustered with people going, come on, we're doing it again? Mm. It's, I, mean, you know, I got ADD. I'm finished with that one. I've moved on. Let's go. <laughs> you know, so, so it's been, it was really great in those environments. If that's the speed we got to go, well, then it's really ADD friendly. Mm. And we were doing so many different type of scenes. It was all great for me. And that's a lot of the stuff I say in the, on the speeches now when people say, how did you function? It's like, because that environment was perfect for hmm. ADD. You know, if you put me in a cubicle like they did with Harold in season, you know, seven or so, <laughs> that was that was hell for, for people like Harold and, and me hmm. to be in a cubicle. You just can't sit still, you know? <laughs> and I thought, and I look back and you go, oh, Harold is just full of ADD and ideas. And instead of internal combustion, it was all external with Harold. You know, the, hand, the shaking and the sh shivering and the quaking and the quivering and the voice and the energy and the, you know, always moving forward and then rushing with ideas that had to be held back and stuff. That was, and then later on, as Harold got more in control of his ADD, you could see he was doing that for other people, hmm. like the red particularly. But I look back now and ADD was probably the way I survived the whole thing. <laughs> and if, uh, if anyone watching uh, is interested in the, the video that you did with Rick, or any of that other stuff? Is there like a website they can go to, or where could they find that stuff? Is there anything online that they could, you know, look it up? Rick has a fantastic uh, website called totallyadd.com, and it's and it's full of North American doctors and science and blogs and places to go. I highly recommend it to anyone who's thinking about ADD or it's in their life or something to check out the, the website totallyadd.com. It's fantastic. Cool. Yeah, we'll put that link up on the video as well so people uh, see it. Thanks for that. Great. Thank you. All right. And uh, my last question for you, we've made it to the end, <laughs> is, uh, you know, I can't end a Pat McKenna interview without maybe my most commonly asked question, which is, are those your real teeth? Yes. <laughs> I'm sad to say those are my real teeth. <laughs> the worst part is my parents, I remember when they first started, they like, oh, look at your teeth. And the first thing my dad said, we spent all the money on braces. <laughs> it's like, yes, and it's my teeth that are making me money. <laughs> it all comes back. Dad. It paid off in the end. <laughs> it does. It, it, it was so interesting because by that look was... I was only meant to last like two minutes in a sketch, you know? Mm. So the, the glasses I had weren't real glasses. They were just someone else's prescription joke glasses. And, you know, pulling my jaw that way was like fun, but it would, you know, you try and do it for eight hours, you end up with this pain in your face and these <laughs> headache from these weird glasses that weren't working. I think it was like season three or four that Sandy came in and she goes, I got you these clear glasses. And Sandy being the makeup and hair <laughs> and food and, and show runner and everything we needed. Uh, Sandy Richardson came. I got you these clear glasses. I put them on. I was like, "Oh my God, no headache! This is amazing." <laughs> I didn't know that. I loved that till that season. It took that long. <laughs> yeah, it was just, again, we didn't know if it was coming back. Why invest in glasses? <laughs> you know, all that stuff, like the early patches, like the, that your mom made and yeah. they stuck on with duct tape and. You know, it was, um, and then watching uh, like a real patch came in one year, and then we got real suspenders one year with some red green. I was like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. this, is, <laughs> this is amazing. We're moving on up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, th thanks again, Pat, for doing this. I really appreciate your time. I know uh, our fans are just loving to hear your voice. And uh, of course, give our best to Janice and Brendan. And uh, nice to see you, man. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, thanks, Dave. Great catching up with you, too. Take care.